Okay, let's kick things off. So the, our first uh, pair of leads for the introduction to optical comm for satellites. Uh, Dr. Mikhail Kuipers holds a PhD in astronomy from the University of Göttingen. His background's in planetary science. He's postdoc in the US, Switzerland, Germany. He's currently working for ESA at ESAC in Spain. And he is the uplink coordinator for Rosetta and the project scientist for AIM. Dr. Susanna Sperlan, my uh, co-lead for the study, holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Southern California and a bachelor's degree in applied physics from Caltech. She was a Fulbright Fellow from 2004-05, carrying out research at the Institute of Material Science in Madrid. She joined JPL's Optical Comm Group in 2009 and has worked on OPAL's Optical Comm for CubeSats and the Discovery Missions infusion plans for deep space optical comm. So um, is Mikhail first? Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the nice introduction. So in this first part of the first talk, I'm actually going to talk more about radio communications and opti optical communications to set a little bit the background. But here, actually, the, the title image is an artist's impression how the optical communication between the asteroid impact mission at a near Earth double asteroid and Earth may look like if this will materialize in 2022, with the one exception that it will be invisible laser light, but that wouldn't make for such a beautiful <laughs> image. <laughs> so, I start a bit with a more general introduction into telecommunications in space and then go on a bit over what's done in terms of telecommunications, of navigation. So generally, the basic principle is that between ground and spacecraft and also between different spacecrafts, it's needed to send the telecommands up to operate the spacecraft and send the data down to get the information back from the spacecraft to Earth. Beyond that, another uh, purpose of communicating between spacecraft and ground is also to determine either the position and velocity of the spacecraft or to determine one's own position, which is the case for GPS and other navigation systems. And in cases like we can see around there with, uh, with the last man, mass lander and orbiter and also between constellations of satellites, also links and communications between different satellites may be necessary or beneficial. So what's now usually done without optical telecommunications? So is this a pointer actually? Yeah, yes, pointer okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, the radio frequency spectrum from millimeter to uh, 100 kilometer wavelengths or kilohertz to, to 300 gigahertz frequency. And typically nowadays satellites are operated in the L to K bands, which are between uh, in, the, in the gigahertz range or in the centimeter, in, in centimeter wavelengths. Now, we are going back to, the, to navigation. So the idea of the GPS and other systems is essentially to find out where are we located. So GPS is a constellation of 24 satellites in medium Earth orbit, which is at roughly half the distance to geostationary orbit um, flying here. And one can now calculate when one can see three of them at the time, when one has a position of three of the satellites at a time, the accurate position, one can cal use this to calculate one's own position. If one also needs to adjust the accurate, an, a more accurate time, then the clock of the receivers, one needs at least four satellites. And so 24 satellites are needed for global coverage. By the way, those kind of graphs make me always a little bit melancholic about human space flight because after the moon landing where human space exploration is now is actually here barely distinguishable from the surface of the earth in the scale. But this is off topic. Um, 
So this is an x. Oops. Okay, the example was meant to show, I'm sorry, that pretty much over, if one it goes over a day, there are always various satellites, typically something between six and nine, visible at any position on the, on the surface of the Earth, um, simply, be, uh, simply by, the, by the combined motion of the satellites and the rotation of the Earth. And to mention that the GPS was the first one, but other satellite systems are there or being developed. The Ocean Glossna system, which is the same principle, has just been completed or recompleted. I think it had been complete with 24 satellites at some point before. Uh, the European Galileo project is being set up. There are currently eight satellites in orbit and the full capacity capability is currently scheduled for 2020. And there are also various Asian systems planned. Uh, some of them, like the Indian one, are regional. But it's in, in 10 years or so from now, there will be various of those satellite systems available, which has some ha or has had some political implications because uh, because of the, the military importance of the GPS system. So the other aspect of navigation is to measure the, the position and the velocity of the spacecraft, essentially to be able to navigate the spacecraft, especially an interplanetary spacecraft. So with radio navigation, the radial position is, can, be, can be measured simply by measuring the time the radio wave needs to get, uh, get back and forth. This is very accurate. And through the Doppler effect, which is also used to get your speed ticket, one can measure the velocity of the satellite. All this is quite accurate. The less accurate part with radio measurements is to, to see where the satellite actually is, where the sat uh, satellite is on the sky, perpendicular to the line of sight. And this is simply because of the long wavelengths of the, of the radiation. So uh, as an example, for example, X-band at three centimeter, and with a 70 meter antenna, the largest antennas that are used by DSN, uh, by dividing the, the, the two and converting the radians in, in degrees, we can find out that the resolution is roughly one arc minute, which would correspond at a distance of one astronomical unit to 65,000 kilometers, which is of course not good enough to navigate a spacecraft around a planet or at a comet. And even considering that if you wait some time, you get a, a better three-dimensional picture by the relative motion of Earth of the planet, it's time consuming and, for example, not good enough for orbit insertions. Now, this would be maybe the moment to lead over to optical navigation, but there is also a solution sticking with radio waves for this, in this particular case. And this is the simultaneous observation of the spacecraft from two different stations on Earth. Then in the simple calculations uh, the, that I just had on the last view graph, the relevant length scale for the resolution is not anymore the size of the dish, but the distance between the two stations, which then will be several, several thousand kilometers. Now there's an additional problem that with the stations several thousand kilometers apart, the atmospheric propagation of the wave will be completely different, which is uh, by itself difficult to correct, but this is nowadays solved by looking at quasars where the, whose position on the sky are very well accurately known, and to use the observation of this quasar that's a couple of degrees typically away from the spacecraft to correct for the uh, atmospheric effects and to, and to do the navigation. So do we need something? Well, do, do we need more? One thing is we have more and more data needs. This plot shows the uh, data volume per image of the different cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope. And one can see that the images are about a, an order of magnitude bigger between the, the first two wide field planetary cameras and the second one and the advanced camera for surveys. Well, didactic it would be better if the, the wide field planetary camera 3 would be still a bit larger, but uh, I, I didn't find a better example. Generally, this is sim simply it's just an upward trend as you get when you interpolate uh, those two here. So one motivation to go to 
optical is certainly that one can get higher data rates uh, to get more data down and also a better signal to noise ratio at least if the, the weather is good one limitation of course is that optical is more sensitive to weather conditions than, than radio waves and also um, the, act, the navigation would become still much more accurate um, while it was for ISPO, for example, possible with radio and together with this delta door to navigate the spacecraft around the comet to get real, you could really, especially also between different spacecraft, much, much better navigation accuracy if you could go to optical telecommunications. And I stop at this point and Susanna will then compare a little bit more between radio and optical. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Thanks very much for coming out this morning. Um, in my part of the talk, I'm going to build on what Michelle has talked about. And then I'd like to give you a um, introduction to optical comm from a system engineering perspective, and also to introduce to you the fundamental principles that govern RF as well as optical, and hopefully lay the foundation for the rest of the talks that you're going to be listening to today. So, as you know, um, RF involves communicating with antennas on spacecraft down to typically dish networks on the ground. For optical, what we're looking at doing is um, having lasers on spacecraft that will be talking down to ground stations. Now, what we've been doing so far in order to demonstrate optical communications is um, integrating a lot of receiver hardware at existing um, optical telescope facilities. These optical telescope facilities are typically um, used for science, so uh, for the purposes of the demos that we've been um, implementing, um, we have been um, talking to them to get time um, scheduling um, so that we can do our demos. Now I'll be talking about three different fundamental parameters of communications. The first being the frequency, as you know, um, in optical comm, we are looking at a factor of at least 1,000 higher frequency than the RF bands. Um, the second fundamental parameter is the aperture size. In RF, we talk about antenna size. Um, optical, we're going to be talking about the size of the actual telescope. That's the lens that will be um, integrated on a flight system. And finally, towards the end of my talk, I'll be explaining um, what the role of the range is in um, system engineering considerations. So the fundamental question, why do we want to go to optical? If we already have a fairly mature um, RF infrastructure, why are we now looking at switching to a different frequency band? Um, <clears throat> so the answer stems from a very fundamental property of all electromagnetic radiation that gets emitted from finite width apertures, and that's the phenomenon of divergence. Now, as um, a wave gets emitted out of an aperture, um, it actually spreads out with a characteristic angle theta. And it turns out that theta is um, the ratio, it's proportional to the ratio of the wavelength over the aperture diameter. So <clears throat> because of the much higher frequencies that we're looking at for optical, it turns out that the angle theta is much smaller in the optical regime. So by the time this uh, beam, this signal reaches the receiver, the receiver can actually collect a lot more of the power that the transmitter sent. So in this case, you see all of the, um, all of the power that does not impinge on the receiver is essentially lost. So as a result, as Michelle mentioned, this means that we believe we can get um, higher signal to noise ratios at the receiver and that will translate directly into higher potential data rates. So a little bit more about beam widths. Just on planetary um, distance scales, just exactly how wide do these beams get, to give you an idea. So we, we know that um, in the RF domain, um, the beams that reach Earth are actually um, hundreds of times the size of Earth's diameter, whereas optical, we can actually um, have them be just a fraction of the Earth's diameter. So let's take a look at a concrete example. Using a 20 centimeter aperture from a 1 AU range, which is the Sun-Earth distance, um, in a band called ultra high frequency, 400 megahertz, this beam reaching Earth is actually twice the Sun Earth um, distance. Now, for this reason, because this wave is so diffuse, you'd actually not really be looking at using this frequency we, um, to transmit back to Earth. So um, we'd be looking at much higher frequencies, like, for example, the X band, 8 gigahertz. So that beam will stay a little bit more focused when it reaches Earth. Um, but 
as you can see, for optical, we can do a lot better. We can have it be um, just a fraction of um, you know, the size of, of the US. So I should mention that in this case, X-band, um, it's actually used to transmit from Mars. So the example is MRO, which is um, orbiting Mars today. But because we still want to do better than this one-third AU, um, we don't use a 20 centimeter aperture. This antenna size that it's actually using is three meters wide. <coughs> so a little bit more about apertures. The way I see it, the role of the aperture is to give shape to that EM wave and to um, start with a familiar concept of taking rays of light and focusing them down with a lens to a focus focal point. Um, antennas essentially do the same thing. And in RF, we have the concept of the antenna gain, which is how well the antenna will focus that EM radiation in a specific um, region of space. So the expression we have for gain is efficiency times the, the effective area times 4 pi over lambda squared. As you know, antennas come in all shapes and sizes and materials, and there's a whole science behind um, antenna design that's intended to uh, give us the desired um, radiation in, in the region of space that we're interested in. But if we were to just replace this area with the area of a, um, of a circle, then we, have, we, we end up seeing that there's this same um, dependence of the gain on the d over lambda ratio, which is essentially the beam width. So related to this is then the concept of directivity, which is where is this power um, focused most strongly in space. And in optics, it's essentially the same thing. We're looking at um, how well can this lens shape a beam um, in a certain region of space. So I want to explain to you briefly um, the fundamental property behind this phenomenon is diffraction. So if you recall um, the example of a plane wave traveling through a slit, um, it turns out that this plane wave will, um, will diverge as it comes out of the slit. And if you're looking at the intensity pattern, then it's very focused in the center. This is what we call the main lobe. And that beam width refers to this beam of the main lobe itself. But why does it actually start diverging this way? Well, the real reason is because um, we have scattering here in all directions at the edges. So intuitively, you can see from this picture, if, um, if, these, if these edges are close together, then the effect of these ringlets coming out is more pronounced. And in fact, that's what I used to remember it, that um, small apertures lead to wider divergence angle. But essentially, that's the same concept as in optics, where um, telescopes have the ability to focus a uh, point source down to a, a beam that's a finite width. So um, this diffraction phenomenon is essentially what's behind um, the idea of resolution in telescopes, too. So you want to get much wider apertures that will give you better performance in terms of both optical as well as, for example, um, scientific observation, right? So the main takeaway here is that for performance, bigger apertures are always better. But then again, we end up running into the issue of portability. So when we talk about going to space, we're always going to be limited by the amount of mass we can take to space, or for that matter, anywhere. So the concept of directivity then in RF, um, it's essentially the same thing. When um, EM waves are emitted from, um, from antennas, they end up having a characteristic um, antenna pattern. And you end up with a main lobe where the power is uh, focused in a certain direction. And then the receivers also have um, sensitivity um, that's um, they're more sensitive receiving signals in certain directions. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is um, the signals have to align when you're actually trying to transmit. So when, when we're looking to start talking to spacecraft from space, there's always an acquisition phase. And basically, um, that means that we are looking for the signal. We are trying to align the axes of that main lobe from the transmitter and the receiver. Um, so how is this actually done in RF? Well, you might use the ephemeris, which is typically um, works well for coarse pointing. Um, and that's essentially the prediction of where the spacecraft is. Um, in some cases where you have the transmitter and receiver closer together, um, 
you can actually get feedback in real time, so that will help align um, those signals um, and maximize the power, so we call that the fine pointing. But again, as you can see, the directivity of the antenna makes this challenging. Um, and sometimes we, we want to have antennas that are um, more that are emitting in, in multiple directions to make it easier just for the sake of acquiring the signal. So low gain antennas are sometimes actually used for um, acquisition and critical mission phases like orbital inser insertion. And then high gain, once we acquire signals, um, we use to transmit the scientific data down. So a good example is Juno that actually ends up with five antennas. So now looking at the domain of optical comm, um, the spacecraft has to have the ability to um, hold this laser beam very steady while it's pointing down to the receiver. And it has to be able to reject vibrations and the other disturbances. Um, typically, we use mechanical gimbals. Um, these are also used in the RF domain. Now, um, for optical comm, we might also require additional fine pointing, like um, with the use of fast steering mirrors. And there are other technologies that are being investigated, like um, the piezoelectric and biorefrigerant crystals for beam steering. And finally, if we want to find ways to reduce complexity, we might actually um, decide that we want to use uh, to actually point the entire spacecraft when we're transmitting. So hopefully that'll keep our laser onto the receiver. Um, but that requires that the attitude control system of the entire spacecraft is actually very precise. So the takeaway here is the higher directivity of optical comm is making um, this requirement a lot more precise for the pointing. And this has, um, this can possibly lead to um, increasing complexity, mass, and even in the risk. So now I mentioned that we're going to talk a little bit about range considerations. The simple link equation relates the received power to the transmit power. It's a function of the transmit and receive gain. And then we have this 1 over r squared dependence, which is um, essentially um, how the EM waves spread out in space as they propagate. So you'll hear people talk about the 1 over r squared um, dependence <coughs> of data rates, for example. When we're designing a telecom system, a good place to start is um, what kind of data rates do we actually need? So how much data to send and in what time window? And then we also want to look at the spacecraft resources, like the mass, power, and the volume. So taking, for example, a spacecraft in low orbits, um, these spacecraft will be moving over the receiver quickly. So if we want a good pointing system, it has to be dynamic. Um, but on the other hand, depending on data rate requirements, we may decide that we want to use something that's low gain. So what does that mean? That means the beam is spread out wider in space. And so we don't really have to worry about pointing it um, that precisely in that situation. And that can actually help us loosen our pointing requirements. In deep space, however, because of the large range, um, we don't necessarily have that option. Um, from deep space now, we are um, seeing a demand for more and more data. So we actually want to get as much power to reach our receiver from uh, far away distances as possible. And so that means high directivity, high gain, and um, the trend towards optical comm. And also precise pointing. So one way that we've looked at it um, up to this point is to compare. When we want to choose a telecom system, um, we compare the resources that it requires, mass, power, and volume of um, an optical comm design versus what's currently used in, in the radio domain. And the arguments for going to optical comm have been along these lines, that we can actually reduce resources and um, get higher data rates. So other considerations, there are a myriad of them. I will go through them quickly. Um, the first being daytime operations. You'll hear people say, how well can a system do when it's pointing within 3 to 5 degrees of the sun? Or something close to the sun basically relates to the fact that um, when the ground telescope is pointing there, it's going to get a lot of the sunlight onto its detectors. And so that increases noise. And for certain modulations, that's a problem. 
Um, then we have atmospheric losses, as Ms. Michelle mentioned. Um, RF and optical are attenuated differently. For optical, when it's a cloudy day, that can actually be catastrophic and um, closing the link becomes impossible. There are ways that we've studied to look um, to increase the reliability of optical calm. Um, so one of them is increasing diversity, having possibly more ground stations, looking at hybrid optical transmitters and receivers. Um, do we, are we able to, um, you know, place a receiver in the atmosphere above the clouds? Will that have any benefit to us? And of course, a lot of effort has been devoted to um, modeling and weather prediction. There are also issues of uh, multi-customer accessibility. If the beam is so narrow, um, is it beneficial for us if we want to reach multiple customers at once versus the security of that beam? So um, a more focused beam means that um, it's much harder to intercept. You might hear more about that in subsequent talks. Um, and finally, if we have this um, optical comm system, can we carry out any scientific observations with it? Can we um, use it for multiple purposes? And finally, um, whenever you're increasing complexity, whenever we're looking at fine pointing and um, all of those um, capabilities, then we are looking at higher operational costs and a lot more um, planning and commanding that needs to get sent to the spacecraft. So that does translate into higher costs. So I will leave you with this final note that <laughs> in general, um, you know, when we're talking about space exploration, we are resource limited and so we always continue to want to keep things simple and small. And to summarize the key points, uh, fundamental parameters of telecom are frequency, aperture size, and range. Um, optical has higher directivity, uh, which can provide potentially higher signal-to-noise and data rates, but better pointing is needed. Um, optical is currently in the demonstration phase. We've had several um, projects intended to retire the key risks, but as Michelle pointed out, we need to continue um, developing these auxiliary capabilities, which are actually pretty important, um, including na navigation and science, and continue building up the ground infrastructure that hopefully will um, start having dedicated facilities um, for optical comm. Thank you.